Are you a student, mentor, or parent that loves robotics? Then you're in the right place. Up to date info on all things robotics. This is the RoboZone Podcast with your host, Pete Ekman. The RoboZone Podcast is brought to you by Kettering University. It's a Kettering built world. Hello, and welcome to the 51st episode of the RoboZone Podcast. This podcast is for Tuesday, March 6th. In this episode, we catch up with some mentors and some referees from Kettering Week 1 and Week 1 around the nation. In addition, we have Brandy stopping by for Rookie Roundup. We have a new team of the week. So let's get to our first segment, which is First Updates. Now it's time for the first update. With update number 15 for Power Up this week, we have a very short update in the general tab underneath Q&A under Q366 was edited as follows. The question was, our robot projects cubes from a shooter that does not extend outside of our bumpers. We are confused about how far from the switch fence we are allowed to be. If we add a stick that projects outward 16 inches from the bumper, legal per R04, but has no other purpose, does this legally allow us to shoot from 16 inches away? We want to know, now rather than at competition, we are not looking to violate the spirit of the rules. We are looking for clarification, not loopholes. The answer to this from first was, thank you for thinking proactively. Robots may launch if their bumper is in contact with the switch fence or any part of the robot is intersecting the vertical planes defined by the switch fence, i.e. reaching over it. If you want to launch, but do not want to meet this first criteria, then you'll have to find a way to meet the second criteria or vice versa. In addition, the final update for team update number 15 was under the game and season manual under section 10.7, yellow and red cards. It gave a brief description of the indicator which displays what a yellow and red card look like at a competition. From RoboZone, we encourage everyone to know the rules. Look up team update number 15. We will leave a link in the show notes. So let's get to our roundtable discussion. The RoboZone podcast is brought to you by AndyMark.com, your robot parts experts. With me, I have a plethora uh, of mentors and referees to talk to tonight. So let's start with our introductions. Andrew, please introduce yourself. All right, and this is Andrew from uh, Fenton Titanium Tigers, Team 5114. Jeremy, you're up next. This is Jeremy Callahan from uh, Team Hollywood, 7211. And next we have Joel. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Joel Noble from East High School in Denver, Colorado, and my team is Angel Botics, Team 1339. And with us tonight, we have two referees. Matt, please introduce yourself. Hello there. Uh, I'm Matt. I'm an alum from Team 862, and I spent the past two years mentoring 3322, but I stopped mentoring so I could spend more time volunteering. And finally, bringing up there, we have Nick. Hi, guys. I spent the last weekend refing Kettering uh, Week 1. Uh, I'm an alumni of Team 2337, and this year I'm helping out Team 1684. So we've had we have two newbies to our podcast, and that's of course Joel and uh, Matt, and hopefully we have them on again in the future. With Nick, Nick, we interviewed pretty exclusively last year. He was one of the big guys at the Michigan State Championship, right? You were announcing on the Ford Field, was it? I was on the Consumers Energy oh, Field, and Consumers then Energy. I was on Palestine. Right the 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 uh, the field that that housed the champions of that of that uh, event. So what I wanted to do tonight is we're past week one, but what I want wanted to get you guys on the podcast tonight is to do some lessons learned of what we did from week one from both a referee perspective and a mentoring perspective because as we know every year that when we have a first week one we learn so much from week one and then the game changes from week one through the championship so the first question I have for you tonight and it's for you Andrew is how did your team do yesterday at Kettering week one just let's start with that all right so team 51 14 we ended up being runners up um, we were the alliance captain of the fifth alliance, and I think we moved up. To, oh gosh, I don't remember. We moved up to three or four. I think we ended up being the third. Was it third? We ended up being the third alliance captain, which was great. We were able to pick up an amazing uh, alliance with Team 7211, uh, the rookie team from the Stars, Team Hollywood. 
52-61. We went out on kind of a limb there at the end. We, uh, we decided to pick the best exchange bot on the field, which was 72-11, which was risky because we still had to have a, a scale bot um, at the end. And there was one left. We got really lucky. There was one really nice scale bot left with 52-61, and we were able to put up some pretty high scores um, with that, ex- with with that uh, combination of teams, but we made it all the way to the finals, and then lost to the unbelievable alliance of the Anabots. Two forty-five. What was really stood out this year? They've got a, an excellent uh, swerve drive. Um, I, this is the first time I've seen them with, with a swerve drive. Um, first, it's a mechanum drive. Was it mechanum drive? Yeah. Oh, but anyways, it was it was a good event. Um, I'm, I was really it was really great. We also pulled off a gracious professionalism award. And we were runner-up to the safety award, so that was a uh, it was a great event. We our kids did great. Um, we got to work out a lot of kinks on our robot. We were the only robot that could take a robot up in the air with us, so that was really kind of neat to be that robot at an event. It always kind of puts a sh- kind of shines a light on you when you're the only one doing it. Nice. So, Jeremy, tell us how Team Hollywood did yesterday at Kettering Week One. Yeah. Um... I think we did uh, exceptionally well for being a rookie. We just kind of tried to, this whole year, try to um, go with a design that we think that we're capable of playing, and we went out and executed it. Um, we decided at the beginning of the season, let's be a vault bot, and I think we we showed um, that we were the best uh, vault bot, um, and we had some issues. Um and, and we worked through those issues. So throughout the uh, tournament, so at the playoffs, we were um, at a prime, and and we we were with uh, we were gracious for uh, Titanium Tigers to pick us up, uh, and we made a big run for for the end. Um, I think uh, we 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 battled through some some issues towards the end. Um, I think we almost made out the triple hang um we i guess had issues with pressing the the vault um but the vault uh levitate so we didn't get quite get the third hang but i mean we did finalists and uh we made out with the rookie all-star award so uh, overall i think it was a great uh, first tournament for our kids to learn um what it is we do very nice. Joel, tell us how you did out at uh, the event you were at. Yeah, I was at the Utah Regional um, with my team, 1339. And um, we uh, ended up being the uh, only undefeated team in uh, qualifier rounds. We went 9-0. and Ended up in second place behind 1678, uh, the Citrus Circuits. We selected team 2996, the Cougars Gone Wired from Colorado Springs, who are our buddies. We play with a lot. And 2972, R.C. Dawson. For our alliance, and then we ended up uh, losing to the third seed alliance, which was captained by 30, 3230, Prototype X team. And uh, then they went on and they lost to 1678 and their alliance in the finals. So we fell down a little bit earlier than we wanted to, but uh, we had a great run of it and we had a great time. So a good week one for those for those three uh, teams that are represented here at the first week. So one of the questions, and I'm, I know – I wanted to open this up to the mentors to ask questions to the referees too, because Matt and Nick, both are referees from Kettering week one. So Matt, tell us one of the things that you saw as a referee that you can help teams going forward to prevent them from creating penalties and giving away points to another team. The biggest one I noticed was the G16 penalty, the no territory safe zone. That one was probably what, Nick and I and the majority of refs called the most other than perhaps launching, but teams have to remember that the safe zone, if any part of the other team is inside their safe zone, if you contact them, that's going to be an instant tech foul. 25 points is a big difference in this game. And there's a lot of teams that were hitting that were getting called on that and they'd back off and try to keep getting around them instead of going around to the other side. And it's just something that we noticed a lot. And that's where I believe the majority of our, Penalties were coming from. The other penalty that we called a lot was the launching cubes uh, for penalty G9. Uh, there's only a few instances where you can launch a cube uh, when you're within the exchange zone, when you're within the 
within your own null territory or and then the one that seemed to be broken the most was you have to be contacting the fence around your switch or breaking the plane above it uh teams often would be have a cube in the way so they would just launch it over that but if you're not touching that fence or breaking the plane above the uh, switch it's going to be another tech file for launching a cube did you have fun refereeing yesterday oh yeah it's it's my favorite volunteering position to be honest it's you, you get to use it as kind of a teaching moment for students you get to st- you can help you're not there to like just call penalties and get them in trouble you're there to help them understand the rules and it's a great feeling being able to help people learn and help them adapt so that they understand the game and they're able to play it better and it's also just fun the crew at Kettering is great um I've worked with Nick plenty of times before, so it was always good to be back with him. And then the rest of the people that were at the event, it's it's a really fun social event, even even with us doing our jobs. So, Nick, did you have fun, fun refereeing yesterday? I did. I did. Uh, usually I have a microphone in my hand, so this was my first event refereeing, and I had a, a, tr- a fun time. Uh, Greg was an amazing head ref and taught me how to uh, better – explain the rules to other teams which really helped me out and so i just had an amazing event i love the crew i think that the crew at kettering week one uh, did a good job and i think we we called most of the matches the way that they they should have been called so nick on top of what matt said with the violations uh that he saw yesterday do you agree with it with what he said or did you is there something else that you saw that you can point out for for teams that are going to be competing in week two forward how to help them out um, I second everything that Matt said. The big, the biggest thing, uh, once again, and I'm saying it again because this was the penalty that I felt was broken the most, was launching the cubes. If your intake is not longer than 12 inches uh, past your frame perimeter, there's no way that you can be breaking the plane of the fence if there is a cube, and the uh, if there is a cube in between the fence and your robot. So the Really, if you're shooting a cube from the uh, scale side of the switch, make sure that you don't have a cube in between you and the fence because that's an easy penalty for us to call every time, and we have to call that because it's not a give or take. It's it's pretty clearly written. The other two rules that uh, were broken, not as frequent as the others, but uh, still were broken, were contact with this, um, contacting the scale in a manner that would uh, change the result of what the scale should be indicating. Uh, this w- this was really big for teams that were going up against contested. So if the scale was in the up position, uh, when when teams would place the cube at the top, when they brought their mechanisms down, most of the time they'd either um, hit the little Lexan or just nudge the scale to the point where it would go down to the um, level zone. And so that is a that's a penalty. Every time, even though it's um, accidental, it's a little bit longer than momentary, so we got to call that. And then the other one, um, which I heard was an issue at other events, uh, we were calling it the way that we thought it should have been, was uh, hurting cubes. I guess how the rule was intended to be uh, called was that if you even push the cube like a foot uh, while you were controlling another cube, that would be hurting another cube and that should have been a penalty so i heard at other events i don't know if it was at the utah regional um a lot of teams were getting these unnecessary penalties but how we were calling it at kettering week one and which is what uh, first eventually changed it to um was if the cube was moved in a for a strategic reason then it's a penalty but if it was just you were trying to pick up a cube and you accidentally contacted one and moved it away that's um that's a not a penalty so um a yeah, little there was bit. a lot. Of that. There was a lot of that going on at Utah, and I didn't see it called very often. So yeah, I agree. Okay, so so let's start this next line of questioning. And before we get to the, all, I want to ask all of you because you've all been a mentor or a mentor at this time. We'll get to that final set of of questions. But Joel, do you have any questions for the referees we have on here, Matt and Nick, uh, in regard of some of your experiences from this past weekend? Well, um, yeah, actually. Um, it looked to me like this was an easier game to ref than some of the ones that we've seen in the last few years. Uh, is that true? Because it, it didn't look like it was terribly stressful on the refs that I was watching this week. Every year has its 
every year goes through different ups and downs as far as it is for refs. Um, each one's different. Uh, they have a different focus on what the stress is on the volunteers. I mean, take 2014, for example, where we actually had refs quitting because of how difficult it was. Yeah, um, that's a pretty good example. I agree. <laughs> one of the thing, one of the things going from 2014, 2015, where you're basically a glorified scorekeeper or scorer uh, to this year is the rules are the rules for this year, I think improved much more than they had the past couple years where mm-hmm. as far as where contact was allowed and where it wasn't um, it also didn't have, I mean, you have this, you have the scale in the middle, but it didn't have giant obstacles in the way like last year did or in 2015, trying to look around things or with uh, defenses. So it was easier, even with the scale, to see your zone, your area, and what was going on with the robots. As for the penalties, it was quite easy to... It, the rules made it easy to see what the penalties are and where they are. Um, the definite safe zones, you knew just to keep an eye out on those. Outside of like the just the null territories and launching, there were penalties here and there, but it wasn't too much we had to look for or call. Um Robots generally kept to their side going back and forth, and there was, at least so far, there's not been much um, robot-to-robot interactions. There is a little bit of pushing, but there's almost no robot-to-robot defense. I think this game does a great job of making robots focus on the actual challenge instead of focusing on the defense, which is something that we would have to, which would make it harder for refs to call. And I think we'll, we'll probably see defense as the season goes on. So, um, Nick, can you offer your opinion on Joel's request? I just think that the rules this year are very clear cut on what's allowed and what's not. It's very, if you're touching this person in this zone, a penalty. If you're doing this, it's a penalty. No questions. There's none of this. Besides hurting and momentary contact with the scale, everything else is really clear cut and there's not a lot of ju- judgment calls for the refs to be making. Jeremy, do you have any questions for the referees in regard to the action that we saw at Kettering over the weekend? Um, no, I I think the the refs do a great job doing uh, what they do. Um, I I typically just put it on my students um, to kind of know the rules, and if there's any doubt, like like the hurting call where it's it's up to the refs' judgment, um, then just don't do it. Like uh, just don't give the ju- the refs judgment call of is that a call or not and then another thing just for the audience is if you have a question about something um i suggest just asking the ref for clarification i know uh i probably helped uh, both the refs uh a lot this weekend um just learning the rules and and helping us learn the rules so for that i i, I just i don't have uh necessary a question for them Okay. Andrew, do you have any questions for the refs that we've seen this past weekend at Kettering Week 1? Yeah, I've heard a little grumbling about um, in other events and ours about the some issues with hitting the um, buttons on the in the vault. Um, can anyone speak to some of the issues with that? I can touch a bit on that. Sure, go ahead, Matt. There's actually two issues that are going on right now uh, that we've noticed, at least on the technical side. Um, the first one, which I think I, if I remember correctly, Jeremy had this, Jeremy's team had this problem, um, was that some teams would just hit it really quick and it didn't register it as being hit. And so the, one of the things that the FTAs were recommending was to make sure that you're holding it down until it lights up. Um, and if that's not working, if you have the three cubes and everything, then to make sure that it's known, uh, but for what we, what the uh, FTAs believe for that was that they weren't hitting a lot enough for it to register that a button was being pressed, or that it was too soon with the uh, weight not calibrating it just yet. Um, so you and teams would just hit it and then look, look away, forget. Um, I remember one guy started dancing because he thought that they got the climb and they were going about to get the win and everything, but he didn't notice that he didn't didn't light up. So it's for the that issue. It's to make sure that you're actually you hit it, hold it down, make sure it's letting up before you let go. Um, the other issue is that there have been some problems with uh, connecting to the display, uh, both the audience display as well as the LEDs on the back. The field will read that's a levitate, 
and you'll get the points and everything, but it doesn't register with the LEDs in the vault. And as well as the, we saw some problems with the audience display for this year, not properly updating or getting stuck at a certain amount of time and then just jumping to the end of the match when it ends. Um, there's not much that can be offered, at least for the audience display, but for the LED ones, just make sure, um, just make sure you're hitting it. And if you believe there's a problem, you are able to come up and talk to them, to the FTAs and refs to see if there was something going on. And I'm sure first is looking at these issues and they're logging it and they're going to push out software updates to their, you know, recording system. And hopefully we don't see those in week two. Um, Andrew, were there any other questions you had for the rest in regard to Kettering week one? No, I thought, uh, I think we covered most of them. I was just wanted to bring that up. And so teams would know and make sure to hit that sucker. Um, but no, that's great. I don't want, the one question I had for Nick, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this one to you, with with Auton this year and and capturing that switch or the scale in Auton, uh, can a team get a penalty by launching a cube out of their? What if they get hung up on a cube and their the cube comes out of the robot and goes into the switch? Are they going to be penalized for that during Auton? Absolutely. If you're launching a cube during Auto, uh, you will be penalized for it. So even if you get caught up on the the cubes in the middle, if you get caught up on another robot, if your robot is actively ejecting the cube out of out of a mechanism and you're not in contact or breaking the plane of the switch, it's a penalty even in auto. I thought I saw I thought I saw you give that penalty yesterday or uh, not yesterday on uh, uh, Friday. Uh, I thought I saw someone in that situation and I was I saw your hand raised and I was like, oh, Okay, so we have to watch that because we haven't competed yet. So I wanted to make sure my team gets ready for that type of situation. Yeah, I called it. Um, I know that I called it a few times on um, a few teams. So my last question I have for all you guys is the golden question, as I call it for this episode. All you guys have been mentors or are mentors at this point. Now we all have all had experience with power up for, you know, week one. All of you guys either competed or for two of you, you were roughing. So we're going to start with you, Andrew. Give every team that's out there, no matter what level they are, a piece of advice that they can use when they go to their first competition, have they not done it yet, or if they're going to their second event very soon. How can they improve from week one what we've learned from week one forward? I think from I think we touched on a lot of the different rules and things. Um, really pay attention to what the referees are saying about these rules. I think that's the first thing you can learn. Um, the second thing I think you can learn is Make a packing list before you leave. Make sure you take everything. <laughs> I think from years of experience, um, remembering remembering to take the things you're going to need while you're there. Um, and it can't hurt to have extras, right? Um, another thing to mention is make a whole spare. Ma- if you have the resources or if you have the materials, make a second subsystem for your robot so that you can just swap it out and not have to fix the one that's on there. Um, that will save you a lot of time. Um, I think... Those are some things that I think would uh, I would uh, remind teams. Okay, Jeremy, you're up next. What tell every team out there how they can improve from what you've learned? Before I touch on that, um, to go clarify what Matt was saying, uh, we got we got clarification from the from Greg, the head ref, and the button when you press it, um, it's yellow when you press uh, before you press it, and then when you press it, it should turn red. So you want to wait for it to turn red before you either let go or, or um, end game. But um, I guess on that, the lessons learned is that I believe the vault is a very uh, strategic point of the game where you have to know when to use them and when to not use them. And you have to kind of be honest with your robot of, of how many cubes you can get in the vault um with placing um into the vault and and how go about that um because for us we we kind of knew that as long as everything was working we'd be able to get all nine cubes in and it was a matter of where we placed it when we placed it but some for some teams um they might not be as fortunate to put cubes all nine in and then they're stuck with uh, one or two cubes in, and they're not able to use it to their full potential. Joel, what can you offer teams from Colorado to California to overseas to even Michigan? 
how can you help those teams learn from what you've learned uh, moving forward with Power Up? Um, I've got some evergreen advice that would be true whether this was Power Up or any other game in the future. Um, and I've got some specific stuff for this game. Uh, evergreen advice, um, whatever it is that you think that your robot was built to do, please be flexible with it um, and start playing the game for what it actually does. Uh, you know, you might have wanted to build to go all the way up for the scale, for instance. But if your robot ends up being really, really good at delivering cubes to the vault and not very quick at going up uh, with an elevator to the scale, um, then then stop trying to scale and be proud of what your robot can accomplish and win some games. Um, you know, that's just one example. Uh, just try to try to be aware of what your actual abilities are and then play to those strengths and you're going to find yourself in elimination matches. Um, another sort of universal bit of advice, but maybe specific, especially if you've got some time between now and your first event. Um, I wasn't too impressed with the idea of uh, side climbing ramps. If you, if, if that makes sense, the ramps where they deploy out uh, onto the platform and then you have to drive from where the, uh, the ends of the scale are to get onto them. Those are really difficult and I would say nearly impossible to make work. I saw many attempts to to try to deploy those and then to try to get a robot onto them. And just the geometry is tough. Um, and being able to see from where the drivers are standing to get that robot to get onto that platform is really tough. So if you have designed for that and uh, you have some time between now and your first event, then maybe think of a way that you could uh, redesign those or do something different with your robot because they're probably not going to work. And if you're going to an event thinking about, you know, how are you going to get climbing points um, off of a, of a robot like that, I would say be very careful because uh, I've seen some robots fall over trying to do that. Um, you may be better off trying to get some more points by scoring cubes in the vault than trying to uh, get a climb that is probably not going to get you there. Um, and if, if I can add anything to that, Joel, is that, and I'm, I'm going to inflate um, Andrew's ego a little bit here, their lifting mechanism where we saw, I call it a buddy lift, is it was not from the sides, it was from the front. So they yeah. actively lifted someone from the front. So if someone wants to watch that at, at Kettering Week 1, they did it pretty well. So Yeah, the folks who designed for that actually were thinking ahead and did a great job. Um, 1678, who won our event. Uh, they had a buddy lift that looked kind of like an airplane wing with with a cheese grater combined with it. And it did a great job because you were able to drive onto it from the front. And then they had a, a pretty fail-safe method of of holding the robot on there once they started their climb. Um, but, you know, that design works. I'm not saying buddy climbs are bad, but the the side ramps, the side loading ramps are pretty difficult to use. Especially um, if you have also, a tall bot, right? Yes, right, Joel? because that's the next thing. It's uh, driving underneath the the scale. Uh, there's a lot of tall bots getting banged on the head. And uh, that is one surefire way to get that to happen because you have to go up and you have to go up underneath part of the scale. Um, and if it happens to be on the side that's, that's down, you're definitely going to bang your head. So watch out for that. Was uh, anybody able to watch the double buddy lift from 359 out in um, uh, Montreal? So uh, I haven't either. I saw a picture of it, but uh, 359 was able to do a double buddy lift. Um, so that might be pretty interesting to take a look at as well. Okay, Matt and Nick, it's your time, your turn to shine as, as prior mentors or current mentors and not take the referee hat off and put the mentor hat on. Matt, what can you suggest or what can you improve, help to improve other teams that are going to be competing going forward? What have you learned? Oh, God, there's so much that I got just from this event, but I'll try to make it uh, concise and short for you. Main universal thing I want to say is the center of gravity robot. You need to know where it's at. There were there was a lot of tipped robots um, th this year, and I mean some of these games just 
you're going to have them because of the way the game is played. Having to raise up and not having a height limit is going to cause you to want to go up high, but you need to make sure that your robot, uh, its center of gravity stays either low in it or you're able to know how to move it. Too many times I saw a robot raise up and then back up and then stop, and they just kept going and tipped over. Um, the next one for Universal that goes more into specific is every team needs to learn a bit to that the strategy you go into a match with what you're planning to do, it's going to need a change on the fly. And this year is more important than any other year um, with the uh, controlling different points between the scales and switches. When you already control something, maybe put an extra cube on there just so they, the other team can't even it out right away. But there's no reason to have six cubes on your switch. And the, when the other team doesn't even come over um, same thing with the scale, if the other team can't use the scale, cause for some reason they don't have a bot that can do it. Uh, you don't need to keep filling it up, maybe one or two to get in your, on your side and then, uh, try to do a different task. Um, maybe play a bit of defense, slow down the other team or get ready to get onto your own thing. It's too often that I've seen, I saw teams lose at this event because they were too focused on doing their one little task, even though it was pretty much complete. They, I saw eight cubes on a switch in one match, and there was not a single one on the other from the other alliance on that switch, and there's just no need for that. Um, next is the, I think it's very important for pe- for teams to learn how levitate is scored. Uh, this is something that I noticed is that we actually figured out during the event how it was properly scored based off the ref panels, but levitate is scored to it first goes to the lowest scoring team so there's three options at the end game the nothing there's parking and then there's a climb or scale if it it goes to the lowest the one that will give you the lowest points first for any one of the robots it's given to one robot so if you have a robot that's not doing anything but the other two are parked it will give it to the robot that's not do that's not on the platform and so that robot doesn't need to try and get on the platform it's going to get that points if they have the levitate active another thing is something i think that i saw um uh, titanium tigers and Hollywood doing was when they did their double climb, their third robot didn't try to get on and they had the levitate. So they got all three on there, even though the third robot was still off doing whatever. Um, if that, if you have that levitate, the last robot doesn't need to try and get on the platform and compete for that little bit of space that's on there. And the very last thing is just the importance of the, of the vaults and power ups. The human player needs to know what's going on with that. Um, the human player needs to be uh, smart when activating it and making sure that he is activating it, learning what it does. Uh, the color will change from yellow to whatever your alliance color is once it's activated. Um, so they just need to make sure that, one, they're activating it, and two, that they're activating it at the right times. Uh, levitate is doesn't really matter, but for the force and for your own, your own buff for it, um, the timing is important for that. Uh, the last thing is the auto it's every team should have an auto that just moves forward a bit. Um, anyone, someone at the event could probably help you make it if you're a newer team or don't have the resources necessarily to do it on your own, but it's very important for that one ranking point. If one teammate can get one onto that switch and all three robots move, it's the easiest ranking point that I've seen in, in recent history of first games. Um, I think that's all for mine right now. So can, I, can I add on to that ahead. a little bit? With the, sure, Joel. Go ahead. So the youth, we had something called Project uh, Go Forward, where Team 159 and 1678 and my team uh, teamed together and sent our programmers out to take an inventory of all of the other teams um, and whether or not they had an auto routine and then try to help them all get that auto routine. We did. We actually did it at several different points in the competition once when everybody was unbagging and getting set up once when people were uh, really getting, trying to pass inspection, and get out on the field. And then once when we were in the midst of competition, uh, because early on people really wanted to say, yes, we've got it. But then once you got some data and saw that they didn't have it, you'd kind of go back and say, look, we want to help you get this going. Um, I know that outside of first robotics, it feels weird to have a competitor say we want, to help you be more competitive with us, but it really is the way first works um, for people to want you to be successful. Uh, we'd like you to be at the peak of your game uh, before we try to beat you. <laughs> that makes sense. And 
uh, and it was actually really helpful. We ended up with uh, the one RP in, I think, the majority of games that were played in Utah because uh, there were so many teams that wanted to help other teams get that uh, their autonomous going. And I actually think that this uh, represents a watershed moment for first robotics when when autonomous becomes something that the majority of teams can do and will do going forward. Yeah, that's that's a great initiative that you guys did out there. I I would hope that we see that at every competition. Did, Matt, I did have two follow up questions to what you said. So prior to this, prior to the season starting, the re- the way I read the levitate ability was that it was totally randomized. That while you still put the cubes in and you activate it, it totally randomizes of who gets that, not dependent on if one not scales. Is that correct? I That's not what we saw with it. Um, and we actually saw this. I actually saw this firsthand based off the ref panel because it actually gives you um, – most people aren't familiar with the ref with how the ref panel works. But when we're scoring the hangs, it uh, all three teams show up and then it shows uh, who's – who's going to be, or and we have to put in what position there are, whether they're climb, parking, or not, nothing, not doing anything on the platform. Um, and the box, the box that says which team is being levitate, uh, it's not, it's not randomized. It goes first to the person who has the lowest points. And then it goes just in order from, I believe one, two or three. Um, if they're, if the lowest scoring one is on the same level, um, so, but, will, but you mean will, the lowest scoring one? You mean the lowest scoring robot out of the three bots on the alliance? Yep. And by that I mean, uh, if I have a robot that's climbing, a robot that's parked, and a robot that's not doing anything, and that's how I scored it, um, the it will go to the one that's not doing a, that's not on the uh, platform. Okay, I got. And you. It will actually switch based off what you put in. So if someone falls off the platform and then the robot that was off goes onto it, it will then move to the other one. So it's a fluid thing up until the match ends that goes to the lowest one. And then it just goes to when if there's two if there's one robot climbing and two parked, it will just go to one of those. And I believe it goes to alliance member one and then alliance member two and then three in uh as their order. So the so the lessons learned, just to clarify, so for people that are listening, the way I'm interpreting what you're saying is that if Andrew I'll use the the three mentors that are here, right? Andrew climbed. He pulled Jeremy up with him because they have a buddy bar, and Joel just stood on on off to the side and not hit the platform. Joel's team would automatically get awarded the levitate. Yes, that's right. You scored it, yeah. And it's okay. and using that time wisely. Besides just sitting there is probably a good idea. Um, score some more cubes in the vault. Um, if I can just say one sure. thing, a clarification. So I just. Check the way that the I just went into the rules just to check the way that levitate scored really quick. And it says if levitate is played the uh, is played the climb is credited randomly to a robot on the alliance who is not parking or climbing at the end of the match. If all robots on the alliance are parking or climbing, one ran uh, one randomly chosen parking robot will be upgraded from parking to climbing. So that's just okay. saying it. The order for it is as we were saying it goes from the nothing to the parking, and then there's no point if you're all three are climbing, but that's not exactly. Nick, you've been pretty quiet only because we've been holding you off. Give us what you what you learned from this last weekend and how you can put your mentor hat on and help a team. How can you help a team going forward? So the I have four points that I have. Um, the first one, and I think all three of the mentors here will agree with this, bring and drink water. Pretty clear. That is pretty I, wise, dude. That's when I was on a team, I would drink a half a bottle of water after every single one of my matches uh, because you, you got to keep yourself hydrated. Honestly, the, being dehydrated at a robotics event is the worst feeling you can have. You it, Just bring and drink water. Um, a second thing, uh, this relates to the game. Um, assess how much a cube can be worth. A cube can either be worth zero points or 250 points dependent on the opposing lines and where you place it. I saw a lot of matches where if a team would have put a cube on the opposing lines' switch, it would have balanced out that switch, and the opposing lines would have been, you would have been docking them points. However, the team would then go straight to the scale, 
and um, place the cube on the scale, and then it would do nothing for them. So uh, assess how much a cube can be worth uh, and place it in the zone accordingly. Uh, the second thing is understanding the game and be dynamic. Um, be prepared to change your strategy on the fly. This game is a very uh, tennis-like game. It's very back and forth. So uh, be prepared to score in the opposing switch and then all of a sudden have to fly over to your side of the field and score in your switch. Um, just be ready. You can go in with a plan. Uh, how I've seen a lot of the matches, uh, because the team that I'm mentoring right now, uh, we just did a study session on all the events and how robots were moving around. Um, the first like 30 seconds of teleop, it's pretty standard on what teams are doing. But then after that, it's all based on who dropped a cube and who didn't. Uh, so just be dynamic and uh, be ready to change your strategy on the fly. Uh, the last thing, and this is a uh, prep before the event, um, use your unbag time and your 30 pounds of manufactured parts outside of the robot, outside of the bag. Uh, if you need help with this, um, one of the, one of the teams I always point to is 5460 uh, out of the pier. Uh, they, I credit them as the masters of unbag time and 30 pounds of withholding allowance. Uh, they never have the same robot twice. You never know what they're going to bring. Uh, so if you need any help with understanding those rules, um, I, I just take a look at what they've done because they've changed their robot completely uh, with their unbag time and their 30 pounds of withholding. So um, that's all I've got. Uh, for preparation but once again bring and drink water at the end of our podcast we're at the end of the recording i want to thank all of you for coming on tonight and hopefully we'll have you on again as the season goes on so as you tell us or as you um sign off just tell us who you are what your role on the team is and then how we can follow your team so we're going to start with you andrew this is andrew from team 5114 the titanium tigers i am the scouting mentor and strategy mentor um yep uh you can follow me and find me on twitter find me on facebook find us anywhere you want all this <laughs> pretty much anywhere um we look forward to uh competing with everyone all right bye you're up next jeremy yes i'm uh jeremy callahan uh with team hollywood 7211 um uh, we now have our team website, Team Hollywood 7211 at Weebly.com. We are on Twitter at Hollywood 7211. Uh, we have a YouTube page. It's, it's Team Hollywood FRC 7211. And we are also on Instagram at FRC 7211. And we have some awesome videos of our vault uh, vaulting. And you're next, Joel. Yep, I'm Joel Noble. And I am the head coach of Team 1339. I've been with them since we started playing this game in 2004. And uh, if you want to find us, you can find us on our webpage. It's angelbotics.com. Or you can find our YouTube page, which is also just angelbotics. Uh, we got some pretty great videos, including some nice reveal videos that our students made for this year's game. Um, and it would be great to communicate with more of you out there and, and uh, collaborate over the years. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Matt, you're next. So while I'm no longer on a team or, and I've stopped mentoring for my old teams, uh, team 862 lightning robotics, uh, their Twitter is FRC 862. And for team 33, 22 Eagle Imperium, theirs is uh, Eagle Imperium and all of their links and everything can be found off the blue Alliance. If, you search up their team, but you should go check them out. Thank you for coming on, Matt. And finally, Nick. Uh, so for me, you can follow me on Twitter. My at is Nick Shark Clark. For my team, uh, 1684, I believe our Twitter is at Chimera's1684 on Twitter. And we also have an Instagram. I don't know what that one is. And I just want one final thank you to all you guys for coming on tonight. Uh, good luck with all your teams in the future. And Nick and uh, Matt, c continue to do the great roughing that you're doing. We'll see you later on the season. Thank you. See you around. Up now is the RoboZone Rookie Rundown. Hi, this is Pete. With me, I have the none other than the infamous Brainy Bollinger. Brainy, how are you doing tonight? Good. We've survived week one of competition. We We're did. We did, and we saw each other at Kettering. So 
It was fun. I, I had the immense honor of being one of the safety advisors at the Kettering One District. So I've got some, I think, insider information that I think rookie teams will really be benefiting from this week. Nice. And not only that, but you got uh, recognized. Didn't a young individual that listens to the podcast come up and say something to you? Yeah. A student came up from, I'm not, I don't remember which team you're from. I'm sorry if you're listening, but uh, you made my day telling me that you like hearing the segment that I do. And that's so. why we have you on here, Brandy. I told Thanks you. Thanks to that guy. You're a fan favorite, whether you like it or not. So let that brighten <laughs> your day a little bit. It did. It surely did. I'll tell you what. Okay, so tell us what happened at Kettering. Um, so Kettering District, um, the engineers are on the planning committee for the Kettering 1 and Kettering 2 District. This year we won't be competing at either Kettering, but we still stuck around. Um, Clinton was a robot inspector, and I was one of the safety advisors and got to walk around from pit to pit and work with the underwriters, laboratories people on what things teams should be doing in order to create a safe pit environment. And I thought that maybe that these were a few things that rookie teams – and maybe some newer teams might not know about that I thought would be cool to pass along. All right, hit us. What's number one? All right, number one is working inside your pit. So at each event that you guys go to, you're going to be given a pit as small as an 8x8, as big as a 10x10. And it's a safety hazard to actually overflow into the aisleway because then as the robots are going through the aisleway or patrons are coming to check everything out, if you're working outside of your pit area, you are taking up some of the room that they need for that um, IOA. So make sure that you're staying inside your pit area. Nice. Number two. Number two, safe battery charging. So at the end of the night, you should make sure that all of your batteries are unplugged from your battery chargers, no matter how many batteries you're charging. So if you have them plugged into some kind of a power strip that hopefully is not daisy chained, you're going to want to make sure that either the power strip is unplugged or that each individual battery charger is unplugged. Uh, this prevents your batteries from getting overloaded overnight. But additionally, you also want to make sure that you have marked which batteries are charged with either battery plugs or some kind of something over the end of your Anderson connector to indicate that your battery is charged. And then to have the ones that are on your chargers charging only as long as they need to be charging. And then once they are charged, storing them safely in a position where they're not going to get knocked over onto the floor to risk a spill or where they're not sitting on the floor, possibly being either a trip hazard or a hazard for spill. Yeah, that, that's never, never good. And I forgot to ask you, but how many of these do we have? We're on number three. Uh, we will have five tonight. Oh, nice. So what is number three then? All right. Number three, to go along with that battery charging, safe battery charging, is you're going to want to have a battery spill kit. Um, this is just in case something does happen where you do spill a battery, one does break, you drop it, anything happens, it flies out of a robot, which we have seen before. And a battery spill kit's pretty easy to put together. You just need some water, some baking soda, a plastic container to put the battery in, and some um, acid-safe gloves. You can go on to um, first website into their safety manual and figure out how to put a battery spill kit together. But it's relatively cheap, really easy to have, and a lot of teams have had to use these in the past. So that may be something that you really want to consider having on hand for you. Number four, Brandy. Number four, um, proper robot transportation. So one thing that we saw a lot of at the Kettering District was people just pushing their cart and shouting robot and hoping that everyone would move out of the way. The better way to do this is to have someone pushing your robot cart from behind and someone walking in front of your robot cart with their hand on the robot so that they can kind of tell if it, they're going to be coming to, you know, a, not coming to a stop as you're coming to a stop. And that person in the front politely excusing the other people. So if there's somebody who's not paying attention, you could just say, excuse me, or maybe touch them on the shoulder and let them know that you're coming through so that you're not clipping ankles or shouting at people. That's a good idea. I, I was there. I saw a lot of people shouting robot. It was interesting. Yeah. And people uh, need to get out of the way. 
I'm just saying. Get out of the way. They do. I think, yes. And the other side of this, besides the safe robot transport, is being aware of your surroundings, that the fact that there will be robots and people coming through, and to kind of try to stay off your phone and be aware of your surroundings when you're in the pit area so that you don't get run over by a robot. Yep, no cell phone use while you're driving, no cell phone use while you're driving a robot, no cell phone use while you're transporting a robot, period. Done. Exactly. What's number five, Brandy? Number five is safety glasses. We've talked in the past about making sure that you have safety glasses for every student and mentor on your team and maybe even a few extra in case you have some guests come up. But having those safety glasses outside of the pits We saw a lot of teams who had to go send someone with safety glasses to the pits to get their bin of safety glasses to bring them out so that people could go into the pits. So make sure that your safety glasses are at a location that's accessible from outside of the pits because you have to have them on in order to get into the pits. So making sure that um, your safety glasses are labeled on the engineers, we label them with all the students and mentors names so each person has their own pair of safety glasses they're responsible for their own pair of safety glasses making sure that they're clean so that you can see through them visibly and that they're they fit correct and please note that i did not say safety goggles because chemical spill goggles are not usually rated for impact they need to be osha certified impact rated safety glasses with side shields And I know all those students that are listening to this or even mentors or parents, contact your grandmother, your mom if she's older. I'm sure she's got some of those uh, glass holders that can hold them around your neck. I know they're tacky, but it's better than having to send someone to the pit. Just saying. You also want to be careful with those if they're not breakaway because they're a choking hazard. So if you've got anything on your robot that spins and you bend down and your necklace catches it, um you could have your face pulled into the robot. I retract my prior statement now. (laughs) As long as those are, as long as they have breakaway lanyards, you're fine. The little clip in the back that'll allow it to separate because sometimes they have like either magnets or things like that. I know the ones my grandma has has a little magnet at the back. So if you pull them too hard, the the thing separates. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. And a lot of of teams give away those um, lanyards as giveaways. So that's another place for you to look for them also. We order everything from ours through safetyglassesusa.com. They sell safety glasses, lanyards, any kind of PPE that you could possibly need. Beautiful. Thanks, Brandy. And uh, before you go, did you want to give any piece of advice that's not safety related to teams that you saw? Yeah. I mean, I think the things that we saw a lot of this weekend was especially on the field and in the pits and just everywhere we went was teams rushing and not taking their times time with things. You know, you're trying to hurry up and get onto the field. You're trying to hurry up and get off of the field and you don't cross your eyes or dot your eyes and cross your T's and you forget to enable the correct auton or you're trying to score that cube on the switch or on the scale and you accidentally launch it when you shouldn't, or you accidentally pull down the scale when you shouldn't. And just taking the time to take a breath and enjoy the moment, you know, like you spent six weeks building this amazing robot and this amazing team. Take the time to enjoy spending with them and make sure that you're keeping up with the competition. Yes. But at the same time, enjoying the moment and your rookie season will be come and gone before you know it. I mean, ours was 10 years ago. This is our 11th season. And I just, I just look back now and I think to myself, like, this is where it all begins and take the time to take the picture and do the things that you need to do in order to remember that day. And the only thing I can add to that is if you're the human player and you're in charge of the vault, make sure you hold the button down so it changes color so you get the power up. <laughs> yeah, don't just skim it and that. walk away. Make sure that it actually hits the hits the light. And I, I guess, too, don't, don't be afraid to ask the field crew for help. At any district or regional that you go to, those people are there as volunteers and they want to see you have a successful event and ask them for help. Go send a student to the question box if you have a question on the rules or need a clarification. If you're having trouble getting communications on the field, 
ask the FTA. They'll come over to help you troubleshoot. They won't bypass you immediately. If you have a question in the pits, ask the inspectors, ask the CSAs, ask pit administration. They will be more than glad to help you or point you in the right direction. And if all else fails, ask a team. Teams are there to help too. Thanks, Brandy. Thanks for stopping by uh, on behalf of RoboZone. I want to wish you guys a good luck this coming uh, weekend. You guys, where are you guys com- competing at? We are competing at the St. Joe's, Michigan district. So there's also a St. Joe's down in Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, someplace down south. But we will be at the Michigan district for St. Joe's on competition week two. Then we're off again until week five. Okay, so we'll check in with you next Monday, and uh, that's if you don't have a robo hangover. We'll we'll cross our <laughs> fingers for you. All right, thanks, Pete. Take care. Up next is the RoboZone Team of the Week. For this week's Team of the Week, we have picked Team 1339, the Angel Botics out of Denver, Colorado. The Angel Botics was one of three teams that went around at their location for their competition, and instead of working on their robot, they were making sure that other teams had an auton. They had made things fair at their competition, and for that, we are making them Team of the Week. Congratulations, Team 1339, Angel Botics out of Denver, Colorado. And with that ends the 51st episode of the RoboZone Podcast. Thank you for listening to the RoboZone Podcast, and you can follow us on SoundCloud, on Apple Podcasts, and on Google Music. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next week. For those teams that are in week two competitions, good luck. The RoboZone podcast is brought to you by Kettering University. It's a Kettering built world. Thanks for listening to the RoboZone podcast with your host, Pete Ekman. Find us online at RoboZoneTV.com and on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram.